Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us uh, tonight on behalf of uh, Jews United for Democracy and Justice and Community Advocates, Inc. I welcome you to our program. As we witness the horrific cruelty against the Ukrainian people and as we are all on edge in light of nuclear and other threats being leveled by Putin, we are grateful to Ann Applebaum and Max Boot for agreeing to be in conversation with Larry Mantle tonight to help us gain a deeper understanding of these dramatic and scary times. And of course, our hearts go out to all of those who are directly affected uh, and our gratitude to those in Poland and Hungary and Moldavia who are taking in so many uh, refugees. Uh, next week, Congressman Adam Schiff, member of the House Select Committee on the January 6th riot, will be in conversation with Pat Morrison, both on the committee's progress and, of course, on the Ukraine situation. The following week, nationally renowned election law expert Rick Hassan will be joining us to talk about cheap speech, how disinformation poisons our politics. In light of fast changing world events, we have purposely delayed in filling two of our April dates so that we can bring you the most cogent speakers to brief us on current events as they unfold. But you can mark your calendars for every Wednesday from five to six as we plan on having outstanding programming on every foreseeable Wednesday between five and six. So stand by for some new program announcements. Full unedited recordings of all of our programs can be found on our YouTube channel and on our website. We always provide a link, both David and I, in any email we send. Um, so you just have to sort of look through there to say past programs, press this link. Uh, I wanna thank Mel Levine, Zev Yaroslavsky, Caroline Kelly, Rabbi Ken Chazen, and of course, David Lair for uh, working so hard to make this series as outstanding as we believe that, and I think you've given us that feedback. It's It's been very appreciated. Uh, a limited list of reputable organizations for donations to help Ukrainians is in every one of our judge emails that we send out. It's also on our website. We'll continue to keep those links in our emails so that uh, when you are so moved, you can donate to the many worthy organizations. And be sure to look at the activism section of our website for links to lots of organizations who are directly engaged in fighting for voting rights and for our democracy. There's some great donation and volunteer opportunities. I think that we're going to, uh, David was going to introduce uh, Larry Mantle, but I think David's lost his connection. So I will just say Larry Mantle, who is the longest running, has the longest running, fantastic daily radio show in LA. Uh, those of you from Southern California, listen to him every day. He's an outstanding moderator on his radio show and for us as well. We love you, Larry, and we appreciate you being able to be with us tonight. So now I'm going to hand off the program to you. Thank you so much, Janice. I appreciate it very much. David, thank you as well. It's always an honor to do these conversations for America at a crossroads. And as evidenced by the number of people who have signed up for tonight's program, obviously the importance of what happens in Ukraine with Russia's invasion, top of mind for all of us, hard to even think of what's happening in our daily lives with the concerns for those who are going through this terrible experience in Ukraine. This evening's program, of course, important because as we see these terrible images, particularly uh, here about the besieged port city of Mariupol in the southeastern part of the country, we hear the stories of today's uh, aerial attack on the children's and maternity hospital that was destroyed there, of bodies that are left in the street because it's not safe to uh, take those bodies off of the street and, and to take care of them. Uh, there's a shortage of water and of food in that city. But of course, Mariupol is not alone in the ravages that it's suffering. Other cities are under siege and Ukraine forces have largely held uh, Russian troops away from Kyiv, but in my conversation this morning on my program Air Talk, I spoke with Washington Post reporter Sudarsan Raghavan, who's in Kyiv, and he pointed out that residents there are very aware of what's going on in Mariupol and, and concerned that that could, could be their fate as well sometime in the future. But Russia's military has performed shockingly poorly during the two-week attack. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has risen to the fight with galvanizing videos on the streets of Kyiv in his presidential office and yesterday, of course, with the UK Parliament echoing Winston Churchill 
in his speech. With us to talk about Russia's invasion of Ukraine and its implications for the rest of the world are journalist and historian Ann Applebaum and columnist, author, and military historian Max Boot. Anne is staff writer for The Atlantic. She's written extensively about Central and Eastern Europe and the history of democracies. Her 2003 book, Gulag, A History, won the Pulitzer Prize. She's worked for The Economist and The Spectator and served on the editorial board of The Washington Post. Post. Max is well known to us here in Southern California for his former LA Times column, and like Anne, has made multiple appearances here on America at a Crossroads. Max regularly contributes opinion pieces to the Washington Post and is the Jean J. Kirkpatrick Senior Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, Anne is also a member of the Council. And let's start with uh, Vladimir Putin. If he was attempting this to be a brushback of NATO and diminish NATO's influence. It would seem that he's already failed. What were Putin's uh, likely motivations in this attack? So thank you, first of all, for, for, for being here. I'm delighted to know that there's such a large audience. Um, you know, to understand Putin's motivations, you have to understand Putin's system of power. Um, he is a He's an autocrat who rules almost like a mafia boss. Um, other, other oligarchs, other leaders pay homage to him. They pay him money. Um, he's a kind of spider who sits at the center of the web. Um, the one thing that he fears, and, he, and I should say he, he controls almost everything in Russia. He, you know, you have to imagine it's as if, as if the president of the United States controlled the White House, Congress, and the Supreme Court, you know, and Exxon, Facebook, and Google. Um, and the FBI, the CIA, and also all the local police. So he has really almost infinite power in Russia. He has no checks and balances, and there's no transparency about what he does. Um, at the same time, he knows that his system of power is unjust, and he knows that the potential for him to be overthrown um, is always there. Uh, he, he witnessed the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. He remembers what that looks like. He was on the other side of it as a KGB officer in East Germany. Um, and he fears the power of um, people demanding justice. He looks at Ukraine and he sees a country that has um, sought repeatedly over, actually over many decades, but certainly over the last 30 years to avoid becoming the same kind of country that Russia has become. So the Ukrainians have organized themselves first to gain their independence, um, secondly, to defeat kleptocrats and autocrats and people who sought to deform their democracy, their, their young democracy in, the, in, in 2005 and then again in 2014. Um, the Ukrainians have, you know, are openly, they want democracy and their national identity has become very caught up in the idea of being a democracy and being part of Europe, being part of what they imagine as the Western world. Um, Putin sees them as a threat. Um, a kind of ideological threat, um, and he also sees them as a as a kind of um, a, a country that's standing in the way of his desire to recreate some vision or some territorial version of the Soviet Union. Um, and so he, the the fundamental nature of this war is something that is much closer to genocide or ethnic cleansing than I think most people imagine. So he thinks Ukraine is an imaginary state. It's not a real country. It needs to be wiped off the map. Um, these Ukrainian Democrats with their ridiculous ideas need to be eliminated. Um, and I think once you understand that, then some of the tactics and strategy that, you're, that we're watching the Russians use takes place. I mean, it also has to be said that Putin under, doesn't understand Ukraine very well. He knows very little about it. He's spent very little time there. He has no contact with modern Ukrainian leaders. Um, and he made the mistake of believing that he would conquer Ukraine in a couple of days. You know, they, the original idea was it would be a 48 hour war. And actually a lot of American military analysts believe that too. Um, Max, I want to follow up on what Anne was just saying. So how could Putin send his troops into Ukraine so poorly prepared, traveling light, as has been observed, and, and not trained for this mission? Well, I think this, you know, he's suffering from a disease common to dictators, especially longtime dictators, which is that he's getting high on his own fumes. I mean, he really, I think he, you know, we, we listened to his absurd propaganda about 
how drug addicts and the neo-Nazis have taken over in Kiev. And you think, my God, this is absurd. This is Orwellian. This is, you know, beyond the realm of satire. How can any sane individual believe this? And I actually think that in all likelihood, Putin probably believes a lot of it. I mean, he's really in an isolated bubble, all the more so since COVID-19, where, you, you know, literally and figuratively, where you see him, you know, only receiving his aids at the end of this preposterously long table. And so I think he was basically extrapolating from past history what happened when he invaded Ukraine in 2014, very fast, very easy takeover of Crimea. Of course, he didn't, you know, really account for the fact that his power play in eastern Ukraine never really completely succeeded in that the Ukrainians have continued resisting, you know, and, and the war grinds on after more than eight years there. But I think he kind of imagined that all of Ukraine would be a larger Crimea, ignoring the huge differences in population and outlook from the general Ukrainian population versus the, the population in Crimea. Max, what, what has kept the Russian Air Force from attacking Ukraine and just uh, bombing the, the hell out of the, the cities of Ukraine? Why, why hasn't that happened? Well, I think one of the uh, revelations here is that I think Putin was also high on fumes about his own military because, you know, they've spent years basically bombing defenseless Syrians. And so they, you know, he, he I think, believed his own propaganda about how he had, uh, you know, remodeled the Russian military and turned them into this formidable fighting force. And I think you're seeing the reality reveal right now, which is that they are largely incompetent. They have some good machinery, but they can't maintain it. Uh, the levels of training and morale and leadership are very low. The corruption is very high. Andrei Kazarov, the former Russian foreign minister, I thought had a very astute comment where he said there's been, you know, billions of rubles poured into the Russian military, but a lot of them wound up, you know, in places like Switzerland uh, or, or Monaco. It didn't really go where it was supposed to go, and Putin didn't realize that. There's just been a high level of corruption, which has been endemic throughout the ranks. And so I think there was kind of an ex expectation from a lot of people, I think, that this would look somewhat like uh, the U.S. wars against Iraq in 1991 and 2003, when, remember, the U.S. military very quickly took down Iraqi air defenses, gained dominance of the skies, and then the U.S. Air Force could do whatever it wanted. And of course, then we had ground offensives that were backed up by amazing logistics, even though we had to move our logistics halfway around the world, we could supply this vast army on the march. We could coordinate uh, ground and air forces in conjunction with one another. All these things that the US military made it look easy, it's actually very, very hard. With the Russians, I think you're seeing how hard it is that they are not nearly as good as they think they are. And they are also running into much more determined resistance from the Ukrainians than they expected. And the Ukrainians are turning out to be much better fighters than they gambled on. They've had Western training, they have Western equipment. And the most important thing they have is very high morale, very high esprit de corps, and a, and a willingness to die to defend their homeland, which you don't see that kind of morale among the Russian uh, soldiers, many of whom didn't even realize they were going to Ukraine until they actually wound up there. So, so the Ukrainian soldiers are fighting with, with an existential spirit behind it. But Anne, uh, even though Russia has not been able to uh, make the kinds of military games that Putin had hoped for, we're seeing devastation. Mariupol, a prime example of this, and many Ukrainians have been killed in the fighting. Is, is this the fate of the country for the foreseeable weeks to come? Or is there, there something that could bring about a ceasefire and an end to the devastation to Ukrainians? Um, so, so yes, Putin having failed to win in 48 hours as he expected to do, um, is now trying what Max has described rightly as these Syrian tactics, um, namely just destroy the cities, um, create a lot of refugees, um, create problems for Ukraine's neighbors, but also just demoralize and destabilize the country. Um, uh, it, you know, what I'm hearing is that the thing to watch is the next few days when they make a final attempt to take Kiev. Um, there will be a there is a there there they've been trying for several days to surround the capital uh to take it over they have saboteurs inside the city who are trying to create destabilization apparently that project has failed because the ukrainians have know how to recognize them because if they can't speak ukrainian then they're not ukrainians um, um most ukrainians speak russian and ukrainians but and ukrainian but they 
um, they they shout out at the at people who look suspicious. They ask them to pronounce a few words in Ukraine, and if they can't do it, then they know um, who they're dealing with. So there's a yeah, they sudden, ask them how many home runs Babe Ruth hit. No. That's right. How many home runs Babe Ruth hit, or you know, <laughs> what's the name of the football team in Wisconsin? Or anyway, there was the same same things that we did during the Second World War. Um, but 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 so so yes, the they are hitting the cities. I mean, it is important to remember that there are anti-tank weapons, there are um, anti-aircraft weapons, and there are um, there's you know there are stingers which are. Um, you know, which are, you know, pushing back against this, but they need more. I mean, one of the reasons you're hearing this conversation about a no fly zone um, is that the, the Ukrainians are very good at fighting the Russians on the ground. Um, they really have, you know, destroyed an enormous number of equipment and vehicles. Um, they have much harder time um, hitting the, you know, airplanes. Um, and they don't have, they don't have quite the right weaponry for that. And so they're, what they're asking, the West for is is for help um, keeping the skies clear. I mean, and I think actually if, if that if it if it were possible, even over humanitarian corridors or over Western Ukraine um, to prevent missiles from flying, um, then you would see you know you would see much less loss of life. Um, but 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 yeah, I mean, right now it looks like the Russian tactics are just kill as many people as we can, um, destroy the cities. Um, get people to leave them and then maybe eventually occupy them with somebody different. Uh, and uh, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky had lost significant support among Ukrainians before the invasion, but then his willingness to put his own life on the line, even though he knows he may very well be killed staying in Kyiv, he's still done so. He did the videos from the streets, sitting in his office, talking to the Ukrainian people. And of course, yesterday, that remarkable uh, virtual address that he gave to the UK Parliament echoing uh, Churchill. And what's your sense of his ability to keep this going? So I think he's going to keep it going as long as he's alive um, and as long as he can. Um, he really has um, risen above many expectations, again, including expectations of Ukrainians, but also people in Washington a week before the invasion, um, both by, you know, by acting, you know, not just by being brave, but by showing people how to be brave. And although I do think that you know, Ukraine is a kind of horizontally organized country, unlike Russia, which is a vertically organized country. Um, I think if something did happen to Zelensky, I think people would still fight. I don't think he's he's not the only reason people are fighting. Um, he's made an excellent symbol and, um, you know, an, an inspiration to people. But also, I you know, I genuinely believe that it's it's him, his language and the the, the you know, and the, and the Ukrainians fighting in the territorial army that have really shifted public opinion in the West. Um, it's quite possible that had Ukraine fallen in 48 hours, we would already be talking about the country in the past tense. Um, and the fact that they refused to let that happen and he refused to let that happen is, 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 a, is a, you know, he, he will go down in history, whatever happens next, as one of the great wartime leaders. Max, uh, my question for you is about that no-fly zone that Anne was just mentioning, Zelensky again yesterday, in that speech to UK Parliament, said, please create a no-fly zone. What are the reasons why NATO and President Biden have said the same thing, that uh, they're not going to establish a no-fly zone over Ukraine? Well, the reason is very simple, because we don't want to risk World War III. It's just too risky, because when people talk about a no-fly zone, you know, I think their mental construct is from places like Iraq, where we could easily control the skies with very little risk after we'd already taken down the Iraqi air defense systems. That's not the case here. Uh, in order to create a quote unquote no fly zone, let's be clear about what that means. It means going to war with Russia. It means that US aircraft are going to start shooting Russian aircraft out of the sky. And we're also going to have to start bombing uh, uh, surface air missile sites some of which are going to be in Russia or in Belarus, not in Ukraine itself. We're going to have to start taking down Russian radar networks. And you know the Russians are going to fight back. Uh, and there are going to be losses on both sides. And that's a very dangerous situation because you have two nuclear armed countries in direct conflict with one another. That's something we always avoided during the Cold War. It's very easy for tensions uh, to spiral out of control 
And so I think it's just a too dangerous thing to do. And it's not going to necessarily save Ukraine either, because so much of the damage to Ukrainian cities is being done by Russian rockets, by Russian artillery, and other land-based systems, not by aircraft. So I don't think a, a no-fly zone is a good idea, but I certainly think that we ought to provide uh, Ukraine with every weapon in the universe so that they can shoot down Russian aircraft themselves. We're doing a lot of that already with the Stingers. Uh, I hope that we're providing other uh, anti-aircraft missiles as well. If we keep those Stingers and other missiles uh, coming into Ukraine consistently, Russia is not going to be able to dominate the skies. And it's, 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 it's just a fact that, as the Pentagon says, after two weeks of war, the Russians still have not established their superiority. The Ukrainian Air Force is still flying. And I think we should get on those MiGs that the, that the Polish government promised. That's a, that's a huge screw up and, and a diplomatic mess. But I think maybe there's some way to straighten that out and get those MiGs to them. But I think the most important thing we can get is, is to get the kind of asymmetric weaponry that makes it impossible for the Russians uh, to simply bomb at will as they did in Syria. And this is not, this is not Syria. The, the, the Ukrainians are shooting down Russian aircraft and, and the Russians are having a tough time with it. So why are, what are the reasons why the U.S. doesn't want to be the intermediary of Poland's MiG jets providing those to Ukraine? I think that's an excess of caution. I mean, as I said, we ought to be careful about not, not getting into direct combat with the Russians. But, you know, I think we have every right to provide Ukraine, a country that's been attacked, with any weapons that we possibly can uh, to defend themselves, including fighter aircraft, certainly the Soviets had no compunctions about providing fighter aircraft to North Vietnam or to North Korea when they were fighting American forces. And I think we should return the favor. I think there's, Anne can probably speak to the Polish into this better than I can, but I think there has been some ham-handed uh, negotiations and diplomacy. The Poles went off on, on you know, unilaterally uh, yesterday, and I think people in Washington were caught by surprise. It's kind of a mess, but I think there's a sense that the Pentagon and, and National Security Council have gotten some cold feet about simply letting the Ukrainians pick up these Polish jets and let's say at Ramstein Air Base as the government of Poland offered. I think we ought to do it. I don't, I don't think the Russians okay. are not going to start World War III because we provide those jets. Uh, and quick comment on that, and then we'll get some of uh, our other questions. Yeah, I, do, I, I, I mean, unfortunately, I know a little bit of the Polish background. I mean, it, um, this is a long and different story. Um, the Polish government and is a is a populist, um, um, also kind of tending in the direction of autocratic governments. And one of the things they did was fire quite a lot of competent diplomats and competent civil servants, and um, even competent generals. And what I worry might have happened is that they just don't have good ways of talking to Washington right now. And that may be one piece of the story. Um, I also think, though, um, that the U.S. is there. There's a there's a you know we we're letting the Russians set the terms of what escalation means, um, and you know I'm not sure what the what's the difference between giving the Ukrainians um, stingers or javelins and giving them aircraft. I don't see that that's a you know we're you know we're arming them or we're you know in one way or we're arming them in a different way, and I don't understand why that's such an enormous difference. But as I said, some, somebody seems to have got cold feet in, in Washington, too. And is the red line, as you see it from the U.S. and NATO perspective, Russian forces attacking a NATO member nation? Is that is that a bright red line for what would involve NATO military, militarily? That's what they've said. Um, I hope that's true. Um, I would I actually think that we're making a great mistake if we could imagine that Ukraine could lose and there would be no consequences for NATO countries. Um, I think it would have a enormous um, psychological effect on NATO and on Russia in different ways. And I think that we are going to discover in the course of this war that we can't let Ukraine, we cannot let Ukraine lose. Um, and so although NATO, I guess, crossing the border is some kind of red line at the moment, I think we're going to discover that that's insufficient. I mean, I think, I think one, one impact of the Russian invasion is I think it actually makes it much more likely that we will go to war to defend the Baltics or Poland or Romania or other frontline states, just because you see the level of outrage in the West 
um, you know, in the past, I think there was always kind of a little bit of a question mark as to whether we would be willing to enforce Article 5. Right now, I think there's no doubt. And I think we're building up U.S. and NATO forces in those frontline states. In other words, doing exactly the opposite of what Russia wants to see. Max, I also wanted to ask you about the nuclear deal uh, that the U.S. and and Russia you know, signed on to about Ukraine exchange for giving up its, its uh, nuclear sites that uh, it would not be uh, invaded by the signatories to that. I know it's not a binding agreement, but um, your thoughts about whether that gives any opening for the US to defend Ukraine against Russia. As a practical matter, perhaps not, because it's the same nuclear against nuclear power that everybody's concerned about. But uh, in terms of those agreements, how do you see it? Well, again, I don't think we're going to fight directly for Ukraine because if we want to risk World War III, but we have every right to help Ukraine as a sovereign nation, regardless of the 1994 Budapest Memorandum. But yes, Russia is in violation of the Budapest Memorandum in, under which Ukraine agreed to give up their nuclear weapons in return for uh, Britain, Russia, and the U.S. guaranteeing their territorial integrity. And by the way, one of the lessons that other countries are going to take away from this is do not give up nuclear weapons and acquire nuclear weapons as, to the greatest extent possible, because I don't think there's much chance that Putin would be invading Ukraine if it were still a nuclear armed state. So, you know, think about what kind of message that sends to Iran or North Korea or other rogue states around the world. It, it's making them realize how important it is to have nukes. And I, I wanted to ask you about uh, Eastern Ukraine, because one of the things that we heard prior to the invasion was that there were a number of people who Russian was their primary language and uh, in a sense wanted to, to go back to the old Soviet Union, that there was some nostalgia for that. Do we have any way of knowing what the range of responses are in the East to this attack? Has it maybe strengthened a sense of Ukrainian nationalism even among many of the people in the East? Or are there those who are thinking, well, this is the chance for us to you know, essentially uh, reclaim the, the old way of, of the USSR? So first of all, you know, Ukraine is a bilingual country. Um, everybody in the country speaks Ukrainian and Russian, almost everybody. A few people in the West don't speak Russian. A few people in the East might not speak Ukrainian. But, you know, as Belgium is a bilingual country, as, you know, other, other, other countries are as well, um, uh, and being Russian speaking doesn't mean that you are Russian in the same way that being English speaking, if you live in Ireland, doesn't mean that you're English. You can be Irish, but you speak English. Um, and so the... Um, it's been a mistake. I think Putin made this mistake, and some in the West have also made the mistake of imagining that the eastern part of Ukraine wanted to be Russian. Um, having said that, I mean, of course, there are, you know, there's a potential fifth column. There were people who were disgruntled about the Kiev government and so on um, in the East as, as anywhere else. Um, one of the things that's happened, though, in the last couple of weeks is that even the, you know, the, the mayors in cities that were you know, more doubtful about Zelensky or more doubtful about the Kiev um, government in Kiev have really solidly um, organized themselves against this invasion. And so Kherson, which is a, you know, far eastern city, uh, Mariupol, which has actually been on the border for the last eight years and has been fighting that whole time. Um, Mayor of Odessa, which is a, you know, historic, you know, historically Russian speaking city, Russian and Jewish, I should say. Um, has been absolutely clear that they will fight back. So, so one of the things the invasion, the brutality of the invasion, the unprovoked nature of the invasion, and the unjust feeling of the invasion, I think, have solidified all Ukrainians of all you know. And, and Ukraine is a divided in many ways, just like America is in other countries, um, very you know different politics in different places. Um, nevertheless, has has really united behind Zelensky and behind the 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 war. Um, so I don't, you know, I'm sure there are some fifth columnists somewhere, and I'm sure that there's somebody waiting to, you know, step in if the Russians win. Um, but but the but the vast majority of the country has united against the the war. Uh, Max, uh, is there a potential of Russia tipping, even with the steady steam stream of propaganda and the blackouts of news from outside the country? Um, a chance of Russians taking to the street, obviously risking their lives and their freedom to do so. But it, but at some point, does it reach that tipping point? 
I mean, I, there certainly have been protests and, and very brave people in Russia who are risking beatings by the police and lengthy prison sentences uh, to, to go out there and protest the war. And even, you know, there was just a poll taken just a day or two ago, and you wonder how accurate is any poll in Russia? Not very accurate, but even there, it was finding only about 56% support for the war. Uh, and, and, you know, there's probably a lot more opposition and people are willing to admit to some random pollster who calls them up. So I don't think the war is all that popular. And, and that's why Putin is trying to hide it from his own people. He refuses to use the word war. He calls it a special military operation. There's actually been a flap in Russia the last day or so because of revelations that Russian conscripts are fighting in Ukraine, which Putin promised they would not be doing. And so I think there is some concern that there was, you know, a Russian mother's movement in the 1980s because of all the losses the Russians were suffering in Afghanistan. Uh, and this is like way exponentially more than that. I mean, there was just a report out of the Pentagon just a few hours ago of new estimates of Russian killed in action, five to 6,000, which means probably at least 15,000 wounded. I mean, you're, and remember, I mean, Russia was, you know, fighting in Afghanistan for a decade and there are various estimates of casualties, but perhaps 15,000 Russians died in Afghanistan. So they're going to blow through that in a few weeks' time. So the casualties are, are much higher than anything that they've gotten used to. And I think Putin is afraid of the blowback. But I mean, he does run a very effective police state. So I would not look for a people power revolution. I think if there's any way to get rid of him, it would probably have to be some kind of internal coup among the army and security services. But again, very hard to imagine because he's very close uh, with, with the leadership of, of, the, of the security services. Yeah, and your, your thoughts about um, Russians taking to the streets in greater numbers? So there's, there are a few different estimates, but there's something like 13 or 14,000 Russians who are right now under arrest, um, which is the largest number of political prisoners that there have been in the country for several decades. Um, and these are people who protested. Um, in the last few days. So, so the protest numbers are low. People are afraid of being arrested. Um, the laws have recently changed in Russia and have become much more draconian. So Putin ran for many decades, a kind of, it was, it was, it was sometimes described as managed democracy. You know, there was a kind of fake democracy and not that many people were imprisoned. Um, you know, people were sort of allowed to get on what they were doing. Anyone who got out of line did risk arrest or even murder, like if they were if they were too aggressive as a journalist or as a business person. Um, but this is a real shift. Um, and there is now we're in a very dark time in Russia, as well as in Ukraine, not just economically, but politically. Um, and so judging what people feel by the number of people who protest is maybe unfair. I mean, yeah. you know, people, people who know they're going to jail for 15 years if they're arrested are much less likely to, to do it. Um, you know, people have children or they have sick mothers-in-law or they have obligations and they feel they can't do it. I mean, this is the true in any dictatorship. Um, there has been the only decent polling that's been done um, um, and, and polling is very hard to do in Russia now because, you know, people are, again, afraid to say what they think. Um, but the Navalny organization, which has ways of doing online polling, um, has, has, it has tracked a shift in opinion about the war over the last 10 days, um, showing more disgruntlement as, as I think people hear more about it. So remember, no Russian official media has spoken about the war. There are no none of the photographs that we're seeing are seen anywhere in Russia. Um, they have just shut down the internet. They've taken down Facebook, Twitter, um, and, um, you know, much, much of the, they, they're seeking to cut Russia off from the world. All of the Russian independent media that still existed is gone now. Um, it's been shut out of the, it's been, it's been um, taken down. And so, you know, people, how people are getting information is, is, you know, it's, is, is now hard to say. I mean, it will now be rumor and so on, like in the old Soviet Union. But that's got to, I mean, that if, if anything points to the government being afraid of its own people knowing the truth, it's got to be those actions. And sure. I would assume Russians look at this, say, hey, we're involved in something here that's, that's deeply concerning if we're not being allowed access to, to news reports outside. Right. And I think it's, I mean, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. go ahead. No, go ahead. I mean, I was just going to say just the you know, the disparity of motivation and morale on the two sides, I think is very telling because, you know, one of the reasons that we lost in Vietnam and Afghanistan was that our enemies, 
were simply more determined to prevail than we were. It just was much more important to uh, to the Viet Cong or to the Taliban to win than it was to the American public to win in those countries. And if you look at the disparity of interest, it is much more important to the Ukrainian people than it is to the Russian people to prevail because the war itself in Russia, I think, has very thin support. Whereas for Ukrainians, as Anne was talking about, there is this upsurge of nationalism. All of a sudden, uh, Ukrainians are fighting and dying for their freedom. Uh, they are 100% invested in a way that Russians simply are not. And so I think that augurs poorly for Putin's long-term prospects because while he can certainly kill a lot of people and reduce a lot of cities to rubble, I don't think that we can break uh, the Ukrainian spirit and I think one of the key problems that he has is, you know, he's relied in the past on kind of local proxies to do the hard stuff for him. Like in the case of Syria, he did not send Russian ground forces. He sent the Russian Air Force and they're supporting the Assad militias, which are doing the actual fighting. Or in the case of the Donbass, uh, he's relying on these local Russian speaking Ukrainian militias to do the actual fighting. But there just are not enough Quislings. There's not enough of a fifth column in Ukraine uh, to, to mobilize behind the Russians and to control the country. So the only way he can control the country is with Russian troops. But he doesn't want a long-term massive occupation, yeah. which is going to continue these losses uh, as far as the eye can see. So you know, I, I just don't know what a good endgame for Putin looks like at this point. Uh and do you have a sense of what the potential end game is for him? Honestly, I really cannot predict the future. I mean, there are still so many scenarios that are open, um, both good and bad. Um, there is a scenario in which Ukraine wins. I mean, in that they, it's impossible to take Kiev and the Russians withdraw. Um, there is a scenario in which, you know, Putin just tries to destroy Kiev you know, with fire bombing or cluster bombing, um, there is a um, there is a scenario by which there's a palace coup and the generals who finally had enough of this um, due to Putin, what the Politburo once did to Beria, who was the, you know, the, the secret police chief under Stalin, and they they locked him in a room and then they dragged him away to prison and he was never heard from again. So, I mean, there, there are so many possibilities here. And one of the difficulties making a judgment about it is that Putin used to be somebody who, you know, if you hung around in Moscow, you might know people who knew him or you would hear things about him or he'd said this or that or someone had met him and so on. He's really been for two years in a kind of COVID bunker um, and he's had almost no contact with anybody. And he it's very hard to know even who's really advising him or who's close to him. I mean, you've seen the photographs of him at these long tables. Um, supposedly that's because he's afraid of getting COVID I actually increasingly wonder if he's afraid of assassination. Um, when you either, think either of the way, oligarch either way, either way, we should not be worried about him, you know, using nuclear weapons or launching World War III because this is a guy who is very, very worried about his own health. Yes, my 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 friend Genya Albats, who's a great um, one of the great Russian journalists and dissidents, was the first person to point that out. Um, she said that. Yeah. Uh, let's take some uh, questions from members of our audience. Um, Let's see. Uh, Sai asks, what would have happened had Trump succeeded in defunding NATO and exiting NATO? Max? Well, I, I suspect this is probably what Putin was waiting for, that, you know, why he waited to go after Ukraine until now, because I think he was hoping that Trump would be reelected. And then basically Putin could walt waltz into Kiev unopposed. I mean, John Bolton himself has said, that he thought that Trump would have pulled out of NATO in a second Trump term. He certainly, it's hard to imagine, impossible to imagine him offering the kind of support for Ukraine that President Biden is, is now offering. And I, and I have to say, I mean, this, I am more grateful than ever right now that Joe Biden rather than Donald Trump is in office, especially after Trump's typically appalling comments about how Putin's invasion is a stroke of genius, savvy, smart, all these good things that, 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 that Trump received. I mean, that's just mind boggling to imagine a US president with that mindset. And, you know, thank, I mean, Biden is not perfect and you can disagree with him on some things, but I mean, thank God we have somebody who is level headed and is in favor of democracy, not trying to tear democracy down. 
this is a related question. Sam asks, how much did Trump's cozying up to Putin lay the foundation for the invasion, essentially leading Putin on? Anne? I think it was very important, um, both because it gave Putin a, a, a false idea of the US, actually. He thought that you know Americans aren't interested in foreign policy anymore. Um, and because Trump's language about NATO um, and his kind of open disdain for American allies made Putin think, you know, it's just not going to be possible for the United States to rally um, the world anymore. Um, so, so the so so Trump really, I you know, I think is um, is really the precursor of these events. I um, mean, his, his his you know his his pr clear preference for Russia over Ukraine, his willingness to try and blackmail Ukraine over, if you remember, it was over, to, it was to do with uh, military funding, um, you know, the ease with which he was manipulated, um, his attacks on the alliance, all that I think may have given Putin the idea that that the West was not, was no longer a force to be reckoned with. So I'm, I'm afraid he did an enormous amount of damage. Um, and this is one of the results. Herman asks, would an off-ramp to the war be Ukraine pledging not to join NATO for a given period of time. I know it was, it was a non-starter uh, for NATO to pledge that it would not accept Ukraine as a member. Max, your, your thoughts about Herman's question? I mean, I could see that as being part of a deal, but I don't think we're close to a deal right now. Although I do know that the Ukrainian and Russian foreign ministers are meeting tomorrow in, in Turkey. So at least some talks are underway, but yes, uh, you know, President Zelensky actually suggested in an interview yesterday that, you know, he might have to give up on, on hopes of joining NATO. And that's, I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's just recognizing reality. I mean, I, I wonder if there's a way for Ukraine to draw closer to the EU to have that economic relationship, even if it's not going to be part of NATO. But then, and I think there's a sense that Russia is backing down a little bit because in the last few days, they, they have not been mentioning their demand to for regime change. They're apparently willing to live with the, with the government of drug addicts and neo-Nazis. Uh, but what they are demanding is that Ukraine recognize their territorial conquest of Crimea and in Eastern Ukraine. Um, and, you know, I think there's, there's still big questions remaining as to whether the Ukrainian government would be willing to do that. Maybe there's some kind of diplomatic language and they're recognizing their special political status or something that might be worked out that would be acceptable to both sides. But again, this is looking down the road. This is assuming that Russia is not going to be able to prevail militarily. And I don't know that Putin is, is yet convinced of that. And so, you know, the, the, unfortunately, the bloodshed continues. Well, and, and uh, even if Ukraine wouldn't be willing, I'm sorry, if the, NATO wouldn't be willing to pledge a delay in accepting an application from Ukraine, you see any way that Ukraine would be willing to agree to that? So I really and truly do not believe that this was the cause of the war or that this can stop the war unless Putin is looking for some face saving way to, to quit. Um, you know, whether, you know, whether or not Ukraine was in NATO was never First, you know, it was never the real reason why Putin was invading. You know, Putin was invading um, because Ukraine, as a as a Western leaning, you know, aspirant member of the EU as a democracy, was was threatening to him personally. He found the you know this Ukrainian, um, you know, the Ukrainian democracy activism he felt was a bad example for Russians. Um, and he's 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 sort of said as much in the last few days. I mean, he's described Ukraine as kind of carrying Western ideology, by which he means democracy. Um, and so, I don't really think any promises to do with NATO were, you know, could have prevented the war or would stop it. As I said, unless Ukraine wins, in that Ukraine repels the invasion, Kiev proves impossible to take. Um, Putin decides he doesn't want to carpet bomb Kiev, which is, after all, a very ancient city that's a part of the Russians consider part of their history as well. Um, in which case, it's conceivable that he could make up a list of demands that could, you know, allow him to retreat. But you know, even if Ukraine isn't in NATO or says it will never be in NATO, Ukraine, you know, can't demilitarize. I mean, it will have to maintain, you know, a large and growing and sophisticated army for as long as Putin is in power.
Um, and I don't think that the Ukrainians will will give up that idea. So I don't know what Ukraine in that circumstance, I don't know what Ukrainian neutrality means. I mean, they can't be they can't be neutral in the way that, you know, Ireland is neutral and basically have no army. Um, so that's not on the cards. And given what you knew of Ukraine leading up to this moment, are you surprised by the extent to which Ukrainians are defending their country? I mean, even Ukrainians in other parts of Europe, we have report last I heard uh, Ukraine itself uh, claiming that somewhere around 150,000 people have come into the country to fight on behalf of Ukraine. Has this surprised you at all? Um, so no, actually. I mean, funny enough, I had an argument with a very prominent Washington um, Russian military expert. I mean, it was just before the Munich Security Conference, so it must have been about a week before before the war, um, and who, who was arguing, he was one of the people who believed Putin would be in Kiev in 48 hours. Um, and I said, well, what about the Ukrainians? You know, they're going to resist. And, you know, the, I had just been in Kiev and had been told of they had a plan already to split the army into small pieces to act almost like a guerrilla force right from the very beginning, which is what they've been doing. Um, and I said this to him, you know, well, well, why are you discounting them? And he said to me, oh, you live in a bubble. You know, you're just surrounded by people who are pro-Ukrainian and you don't see what's about to happen. And I said, well, how do you know that you don't live in the bubble? You know, you you sit around and read Russian military analysis all day long, and you know that. Um, and and so so no, I, I I wasn't. I'm I mean I'm surprised in that there were so many people who disagreed with me, um, that you know one always doubts one's assumptions. But I mean I knew they I knew they would fight back. What I I suppose what is, it's not surprising so much as heartening is the the eloquence of Zelensky and the way in which. He's convinced he and the and and the nation have convinced, you know, the rest of the world um, uh, to to support them. I mean, note that most of the Western support for Ukraine has come after the invasion. I mean, there's now arms pouring into the country, you know, from people who wouldn't send them in advance. You know, which is of course one of the tragedies. Had Ukraine been better armed and had the Russians known that, you know, they might have, we might have avoided the invasion. You are know, you know, deterrence is also a um, an important role for weaponry. Although it, it sounds like, and what you're saying, Putin was unlikely to be deterred anyway. Certainly, the additional weapons would he, have, would have helped he, Ukraine he have might, even. He more might have been deterred. Success. You know, one of the reasons he did this is because he thought the West is divided, America's weak, and the Ukrainians won't fight back. Um, had he had he been more convinced that the West were, would help Ukraine, had he been more convinced that there were more weapons, he might have been deterred, I, I believe. Um, but he, th he thought there was no price. We have a question, uh, and I'm sorry I lost the, the viewer's name, but asking about uh, the U.S. response and how you would grade it. Max? Um, I would give it pretty high marks. I would say maybe an A minus. I mean, there have been some mistakes. And again, I wish that we had sent a lot more armament to Ukraine before the war had started. To Anne's point about deterring the Russians, you know, our hesitation about sending stingers before the Russian onslaught, I think was ridiculous and, and self-sabotaging. But I think, you know, most of what President Biden has done has been tremendous, terrific, and infinitely better than anything that, that Trump would have done. I think one of the great innovations here has been using U.S. intelligence for information warfare purposes, leaking U.S. intelligence about the Russian invasion, about Russian plots for uh, for justifying this invasion. I think that wrong-footed Putin from the start. It didn't deter him from the attack, but what it did was it united the West, and I think that's crucially important. And I think Biden and, and Tony Blinken and others have done a tremendous job of keeping the West together. And of course, they've gotten an assist from President Zelensky, who has been such a tremendous spokesman for his country, and also from Putin himself, who has been such a villainous figure that it's easy to rally against them. But I think the degree of coordination you see in the West is really a tribute to American leadership. And the sanctions right now are much, much tougher than I think most people expected before the war, certainly before, certainly tougher than what Putin expected, uh, and including yesterday the U.S. cutting off Russian oil imports, but the SWIFT bank uh, sanctions, the sanctions on the Russian central bank, all of those you know, are having a devastating impact on the Russian economy where you can see 
you know, in about two weeks, Putin is rewinding 30 years of economic progress in Russia. Wow. And I was going to ask you as well about what you think the effect of the sanctions are. Putin reportedly, you know, tried to uh, um, protect himself in advance uh, against sanctions. So how damaging is this to Russia? And is it likely to have an effect on how the war is is carried out? Oh, I think the sanctions will have a big effect and they're very damaging. I mean, the most damaging one and the one that has not been tried before is this freezing of Russia's foreign reserves, which eventually means that Russians can't access foreign currency at all. There can't be any imports and that will include, that's going to affect all kinds of things. I mean, somebody was explaining to me about how the oil industry, you know, relies on spare parts and so on and technology from, from abroad. And so, you know, almost every sector in Russia, um, will be profoundly affected by this. I mean, I suppose the problem with it is that it's going to take some time to work its way through and to be felt um, by people. And and even more importantly, it will take some time before it means that, you know, Putin can't afford to fight anymore. Um, You know, it's a, it's a sort of three month, six month process rather than, you know, we, you know, and we, we have, you know, just weeks rather than months. Um, But, but I, but I do think it will be a profound impact. Robert uh, asks, how does the average Russian likely interpret the imposition of the sanctions? Anne? I don't know that I can speak for the average Russian. I mean, probably, you know, they've been told that the sanctions are, you know, um, the West ganging up on Russia and that it's, you know, it's a, it's, it's an unjust, you know, attack on, on, on Russia and so on. And I don't know whether most people believe that or not. I also don't know whether most people have felt them yet or not. Um, you know, certainly people who have any contact abroad or who travel have felt it. I mean, they're, they're, essentially, there are no more flights in and out of Russia, very, very few. Um, and so, you know, we, we know of people who have been, um, who suddenly realized that they needed to leave the country and wound up driving to the Baltic borders. Um, because the you know the flights are canceled or unavailable, um, so they felt it. But I I think it's too early to say what how how people understand it or feel it. Uh, we have a question uh, from Steve. Is there any evidence of the Russians using chemical weapons? Uh, and I'll extend that to thermobaric uh, vacuum uh, bombs, Max. Well, the British government today said that the Russians had dropped a thermobaric bomb, which is a barbaric weapon that was basically this massive flamethrower that incinerates uh, people, just a horrific weapon that uh, it, you, who's, with the use of which is a war crime. In terms of chemical weapons, no, they have not used chemical weapons, but there is growing concern that they will because they're starting to accuse the Ukrainians of getting ready to use chemical weapons. So these are the kinds of tactics that you saw in Syria when Assad was using chemical weapons he would accuse the the Syrian rebel groups, the opposition of using chemical weapons. So there is concern that the Russians will use chemical weapons. I think that's a very real possibility, but, you know, keep in mind while chemical weapons are a horrific weapon, they are not a a, a war winning weapon. They will just add to the destruction. Uh, They will add to the carnage, but I don't think they're gonna make a major military difference. Sid asks, how has social media altered the world's perception of the war? And you have thoughts on that? I mean, that's, I mean, I don't know that I can answer that. I mean, social media has altered the world's perceptions of everything. Um, and so um, that's really a, a, a broader question than the ones we're dealing with tonight. I mean, the, I suppose the more interesting question is how have the Ukrainians used social media? Um, and how has, you know, and why have they been more successful at telling their side of the story than the Russians have? Um, and I think that is to do with Ukraine's long experience of Russian propaganda and disinformation. And the Ukrainians know that the right way to respond to Russian lies, you know, when the Russians are lying every day about what's happening, I mean, openly lying, the right way to respond is not with fact checking that doesn't work and nobody pays attention to, but with, you know, a, a better and more genuine and more authentic story. Um, and the Ukrainians have understood that they need to speak in normal language and not in pompous diplomatic speech. Um, you know, Zelensky is speaking on, you know, he's holding his own cell phone and making kind of selfie videos 
um, the um, the you know the Ukrainians are making all kinds of funny songs and clips, and they're showing you know conversations with Russians and showing them abandoning their tanks and so on. I mean, they've been very very good at producing images of the war that are memorable. Well, um, Zelensky and- did this even in his campaign and earlier on, right as as president. This has been. Uh, he, he is uh, a comedic actor and so very comfortable in front of the camera. And you can see that with his videos that he produces. Uh, yes, he's he, he he's an actor, but he's, you know, it's w- what he conveys is something different from acting. I mean, and, yeah. uh, you know, it's he, authentic. He it it um, he he looks you know he looks like a real person. He's wearing a T-shirt. He's not dressed up. He's not wearing makeup. He's not in a strange room like Putin always is, you know, in some weird space with, you know, elaborate, I don't know, elaborate backdrop. Um, and he is with people who other Ukrainians will recognize. And the most famous video he did was, the, I think it was right at the first or second night of the war. And he, he, he took a photograph of himself in front of the presidential administration offices. And he said, you know, I'm here, this is my prime minister, this is my chief of staff, you know, this is another guy, you know, this is the, you know, you recognize all these people, we're all here, we're not going anywhere, you know, we're defending Ukraine. And that was very moving. I mean, it was sort of, we're all real people, we're standing here in a real place. This is, we're in, you can see we're in Kiev, you know, this is my cell phone. Um, and it was, it had this feeling of something that was authentic. <coughs> And that's because it was authentic. Yeah, you know? yeah, and 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 people outside Ukraine responded to it as well. William asks, "How does China figure into all of this?" Max, uh, very uneasily, I think. I think the Chinese are not very happy with what Russia is doing, uh, and uh, they don't. I mean, they like the the idea of territorial integrity because you know they don't want. Uh, you know, countries changing borders by force and, and imagining Tibet becoming free or something like that. Uh, and, you know, they're beneficiaries of globalization, which Putin is interrupting. And so you don't, you don't really, I mean, I think they're, they have ideological predisposition towards Putin because they're both dictatorships, but I think they have very different outlooks as well. And the Chinese are, you know, they're not rushing to put sanctions on Russia, but they're also not rushing to bail Russia to bail Russia out of the existing sanctions because they understand uh, that for their companies, markets in the West are much more valuable than dealing with Russia, and so they don't want to lose access to Europe or America, uh, you know, in return for the Russian market. And I think the the other question with China is what is their takeaway with regard to Taiwan? And I think yeah. you know if they're thinking about attacking Taiwan. I think they would be having some second thoughts at this point because I think they would be alarmed by the degree of Western unity and the harsh economic sanctions being levied on on Russia. Uh, So I don't think that they would imagine that they could easily get away with with attacking Taiwan, seeing what's happening uh, with with Ukraine. And we have several questions from viewers about what, if any, role the Russian Orthodox Church plays here with Putin. Um, very tragically and sadly, the Russian Orthodox Church is supporting Putin. Um, they have the, the 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 church leaders have been very loud in their advocacy of him, and this is unfortunately a very old tradition in Russia. Even in Soviet times, um, the church was often dominated effectively by the KGB, and we seem to have a similar situation now. I want to give each of you a a chance to to close. And and even in this crisis, perhaps closing with uh, a theme that we touched on earlier, and that is the resistance by the Ukrainian people, what we learn from that, um, because to me, it seems this is a tremendous addition to our understanding of how people respond when under threat. And, uh, you know, every day when we talk about this on my radio program, I do come away heartened by seeing the fight that Ukrainians are putting up, even as they suffer these these terrible losses um, to to their cities and and to their uh, fellow Ukrainians. Max, you want to just close this out with sort of what what you take from this? Well, I feel a little bit like Americans must have felt 
1940, hearing about the blitz of London, hearing about the horrible ordeal that London was experiencing, being pounded by the Luftwaffe and just cheered by the British pluck and courage under fire, hearing the reports from Edward R. Murrow, the way we hear reports from CNN reporters or BBC reporters today. And I think our heart, Americans' hearts went out at that point with Lend-Lease and, and helping the British to resist this terrible onslaught that they were facing. And I think it's a, it's a very similar impulse today. I mean, it is just, it is heartrending, but also stirring to see, uh, it's heartrending, of course, to see the suffering and the pain that the people of Ukraine are enduring. You know, see an maternity hospital being bombed today or, or, or the picture of, of, of the poor woman and, uh, and, her, and her kids who were killed by a mortar outside of Kiev. I mean, it's just staggering because these are, you know, you could imagine them being people next door. And to see this going on is, is, is horrifying, but it's also stirring to see everybody from Zelensky on down coming together uh, to defend their country, to stand for freedom. And you know, we talk a lot about, you know, we're, we're in an age where uh, everything is gray. There's no absolutes, but I think this is kind of taking us back to an earlier era because, you know, by God, this is a battle between good and evil. There's no other way to put it. And I hope I'm not sounding corny here, but what Russia is doing, what Putin is doing, this is the embodiment of evil. This is the kind of evil we have not seen in Europe since World War II. And the kind of courage and fortitude the Ukrainians are displaying, fighting for their freedom, standing up to tyranny, resisting this onslaught. I mean, it is just, it's just incredibly admirable. And it makes us realize that there are so many people we talk about battles for freedom in the U.S. and resisting government tyranny. And there's elements of truth in all that, but it makes you realize how safe our, our political debates actually are. This is existential. People are putting their lives on the line uh, to fight for their ideals, to fight for their families, their neighborhoods, their freedom. And by, you know, by God, I think we have an obligation to do everything we possibly can, short of actually fighting Russia ourselves, to help these uh, Ukrainian freedom fighters. And your, your thoughts on this line? So I think what, um, what we're watching in Ukraine is um, really, you know, in, an important lesson for Americans. You know, we have somehow assumed for the last decade that, um, you know, liberal society, open society was somehow divorced from and different from, you know, nationalism or national identity or patriotism, whichever word that you want to use. Um, and that, that these were somehow different things and that they were in competition. Um, and I think what the Ukrainians are showing us is that they're not. You can be a patriotic, ardent, you know, um, you, you know, courageous defender of the open society and the liberal society that you want to live in. Um, and sometimes liberal societies require that kind of defense and that kind of um, that kind of courage. Uh, and so I think for us, given how divided we've been and how um, you know, and how how angry people are at one another, but also at the at, at the country itself and its institutions and its history. I think this is a useful moment to you know reflect on how lucky we are, and maybe we should begin defending what we have with a little bit more vigor too. Anne and Max, I can't thank you enough. This has been a stunning conversation. And I know both of you have been so busy talking about this with so many different media outlets and academic entities. Thank you both so much for being with us tonight. We really appreciate it. You, you were wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, also, next Wednesday, two special guests I've collectively known for more than 60 years, Congressman Adam Schiff with Los Angeles Times columnist Pat Morrison. That's next Wednesday, March 16th, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. And remember, you can support these two nonprofit entities that put on America at a Crossroads every Wednesday evening. You can contribute on the website of either Community Advocates, Inc. or Jews United for Democracy and Justice. That's Jews United for Democracy and Justice or Community Advocates, Inc. Thank you so much for joining us for another America at a Crossroads. I'm Larry Mantle. Good night.